All right, everybody, welcome. This is Maintenance as a Climate Resilient Strategy, an ongoing commitment. We're really excited for this panel. Uh, as a reminder, for those who are seeking AIA or ASLA CEUs, um, the sign up for those is available at the, the location where you picked up your name tag this morning. I'd like to um, introduce our panel sponsor, AECOM, um, and Lauren Messier, um, who is there, and a, an associate in urbanism and planning, uh, is going to introduce the panel. Thank you, AECOM and Lauren. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, so, maintenance. Maintenance is not a sexy word. It's not fun. Um, maintenance is taking out the garbage, it's going to the gym when we'd rather be watching Netflix or doing literally anything else, it's brushing our teeth every night and flossing. Uh, these are not the most exciting things, but if we don't clean our house, brush our teeth, and get a little bit of exercise, we will look bad, smell worse, and ultimately, most importantly, just not function all that well. I'm a landscape architect at AECOM, and we currently have a number of projects under construction that integrate engineered flood protection systems into waterfront parks along the New York and New Jersey coastlines, including, to name a few, the Rebuild by Design Hudson River in Hoboken, hey Caleb, um, the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project in Manhattan's Two Bridges neighborhood, and South, uh, South Battery Park City Coastal Resilience, which is right outside the door here. Um, these are projects that will bring beautiful new public waterfronts designed to protect the neighborhoods and communities behind them from the devastating impacts of sea level rise and severe coastal storms for decades into the future. And yet, when we meet with community members to talk about the design and the construction of these projects, so many of the questions that we hear time and again aren't about the design features that we designers are so proud of. Uh, they're not necessarily about the programming, the recreational opportunities, and the amenities, but over and over again, we hear questions about maintenance. Who will be responsible for be maintaining these parks and these flood protection systems? Um, what is the plan for this? And is there enough budget allocated for maintenance in the long term? Because these communities understand, as many of our panelists do here today, that while we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on innovative and exciting projects to help us adapt to a changing climate, we won't be truly successful unless we plan for, budget for, and even get a little bit excited about maintaining and the long-term stewardship of our parks, natural systems, and resilience infrastructure. So without further ado, here to help us get excited about this, um, I'd like to introduce Maggie Scott Greenfield, consultant to the RAIN Coalition, who will be moderating this panel today. Maggie, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm so pleased to see so many of you joining us today in this room. Um, I think we all, um, I like that idea, but like, let's get excited about maintenance. Um, because it is such a topic that we all know is critical to the functioning of infrastructure of any kind, but also particularly nature-based solutions that we need to be adopting in terms of climate change. Um, and we, we know that, but we rarely have the opportunity to get together and talk about it and really dive into the issue. So I want to thank the Waterfront Alliance, our distinguished panel, ACOM, and all of you for joining us to really kind of get into the topic of maintenance and stewardship today. Um, because. Um, as we just heard, it's critical. Like if we don't take care of these systems, like if we don't take care of our bodies, they actually will not function over the long term. So we're talking about investments of billions of dollars we're making in systems that we both want to see function properly and we need them to function properly for the safeties of our communities and our ecosystems. Um, so I'm here today with a very distinguished panel. Um, here we have, going down the line, we have Dr. Jacqueline Rhodes from the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. We have Caleb Stratton, who is the Chief Resiliency Officer for the City of Hoboken. We have Adam Ganser, Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. 
and Marit Larson, who is the Assistant Commissioner for Natural Resources and Planning for the New York City Parks Department. So let's get into it. Um, so the latest report card for America's infrastructure from the American Society of Civil Engineers scores the U.S. a C minus. And we would never be happy with a C minus in this crowd, right? Um, and there's even more. So of the waterfront and water adjacent infrastructure, dams get a D, levees get a D, ports get a B minus, um, but stormwater gets a D, and inland waterways get a D plus. So we're building a lot of new infrastructure to accommodate climate hazards and upgrade <laughs> existing infrastructure, but we're also doing it in a culture and a history of deferred maintenance on all of our infrastructure, um, bridges, dams, roads, and sewer systems. And now we're talking about the integration. Uh, finally, and we're seeing billions of dollars for it come through for green infrastructure, things like rain gardens, green roofs, recognition of our forests and wetlands as important contributors to um, climate resiliency. So really, our question is, how can we turn the conversation for maintenance so we all get excited about it, and what are some concrete steps that we can take to convince elected officials and policymakers that maintenance is essential and that we do that before um, some kind of catastrophic failure occurs. Um, so with that, let me open just that topic to the panel, whoever wants to jump in, and if you, when you jump in, just give a quick um, little bit more of your bio and um, your history and, uh, and your jobs. <laughs> well, I, I will start. Uh, okay. So again, my name is Jacqueline Rhodes. I am the Assistant Executive Director of Pinelands Preservation Alliance, and you might be wondering, what does Pinelands have to do with uh, resilience and infrastructure and all of these important issues that we need to talk about as it relates to you know, adapting and changing to, to the climate? Well, um, Pinelands Preservation Alliance is a nonprofit advocacy organization, obviously focused on preserving and enhancing the Pinelands National Reserve in, in South Jersey. So we're talking about 1.1 million acres, uh, it was first of its kind ever and since. Um, it was created in 1979 and 1980, both through federal and state legislation. But the Pinelands is unique in that um, it has acidic waters and soils. So when you think of stormwater, when you think of the changing climate, we are going to be the most vulnerable to all of that. Um, we extend through seven different counties, which go down all the way through to, to Cape May, Atlantic County, Ocean County, all along the coastline. And with increasing storms, as well as sea level rise, obviously a lot of that can change. So for us, dealing with stormwater, increasing resilience, making sure that the structures that we create are maintained are absolutely critical to protecting this pristine area. So we embarked on this issue about, I would say, seven years ago um, when we created this idea called the Landscape Makeover Program. And the idea was to obviously promote, build the culture for green stormwater infrastructure. But as we all know, it's great to work with homeowners in building rain gardens. It's great to work with municipalities in helping to front those costs, do all the work in building bioswales and looking at rain barrels, uh, poor surfaces, you know, all the things that help to maintain that water in the ground, diffuse you know, escalated flooding, um, and build that resilience infrastructure. What we have found is that maintenance, obviously, you can convince someone to take on a project or get a project for free, but then you have to really work with them to maintain it over time, right? So I think, obviously, that was the question, right? How can we convince these officials to maintain and do that work? And a lot of it is hand-holding. So we adopted a principle through this landscape makeover program that we would remain committed to those projects. So meaning with municipal officials, if we uh, fund a project for them, build it, that if they have problems maintaining, if they need help with turnover with staff in identifying the plants that are supposed to be there, if there's a deficiency somehow that, you know, one of the walls get blown out of uh, a rain garden, that we will be there to help them. 
And I think that's really the initial step to get over um, the maintenance concerns and what seems to be really like a culture shock to a lot of these uh, government officials, and even not government officials, if you're talking about maintenance on schools, um, even for homeowners, like how do we get past that and really the hand-holding has been like the first step for us. So I'll jump in as a municipal official. Um, I'm Caleb Stratton. I'm the assistant business administrator with the city of Hoboken. We're right across the river. I'm also the chief resilience officer. And what that means is I'm responsible for the municipal budget and supporting our directors, but also delivering a comprehensive <coughs> water management strategy uh, in a city where more than 75% is in the coastal floodplain. Um, a lot of the iconic images from New York City are actually pictures of Hoboken flooded, like the taxis and uh, city streets. And so our projects are not just about uh, ecological benefits. There's real dollars and cents involved in performance. And so when we talk to elected officials and when we work with staff, there is form and function in these projects. and form coming in the form of what the planning is or what you see at the surface, but really the function being, are we building what we're supposed to build? Is it functioning the way it's supposed to function? And for us, that means uh, keeping water off of streets, keeping water out of people's properties. There's a, a measurement that we're hitting right now. Um, our practices are functioning 40 out of 50 rain events a year, and we're keeping uh, water off city streets 90% of the time. And you start to lose the top end of that bell curve because of frequency or intensity of storms. Um, but for us, that 90% that we're tying back into, you know, how do things look? How do they perform? Um, and it's a core piece of my book of business to make sure that um, things are ready, that they're functioning, and then uh, just on the quality of life side. I think that the utility of green infrastructure is um, obviously reestablishing natural function. But we have them in bump outs. It's part of our Vision Zero campaign. Uh, we have them at City Hall as a demonstration project. We have 3,000 people walk by a day. They become part of the education and the transfer of knowledge um, literally through generations. So our program's been up for 15 years. We have kids that have graduated from high school that we spoke to when we were there in first grade. And um, if you're not paying attention, Hoboken is a great place to live, work, play, all those things. But we have a serious flooding problem. And as we continue to solve those problems, the only way that our solutions manifest is kind of in the practices that people see and interact with. Everything else is pipes and pumps below ground. So it becomes, uh, I think, an emblem of our comprehensive management plan, so we want to invest in that. Adelia, kudos to you. I remember uh, the last major rain event, there was a big comparison. I, I read the New York Post, I apologize. Uh, but it was very much <laughs> comparing Hoboken's yeah. situation to that of New York City, and it was, yeah. Exponentially better. We're smaller. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but that was by really by impressive. By very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think you know I'm, I'm trained as an architect, and I worked about ten years on the design and construction of the High Line. And during that time, uh, the High Line is a very special project in a lot of ways. But the first way is it's uh, was exceptionally well funded on the capital side. So whether it was uh, state and city funding or individual donors that made that project happen. It was really uh, just a wonder to be on that project. But as we were nearing the end of it, uh, the maintenance costs of it started to become very real. And there was no mechanism for uh, covering the many, many, many millions of dollars of maintenance of that park. Um, and so I, I, in looking at that, I didn't want to have anything to do with it, to be honest. I was ready to get out of there. But I had also been working with parks across the city on general maintenance issues. And I took the job at New Yorkers for Parks, and I say this very much tongue in cheek, to bring sexy to maintenance. Not that I was <laughs> gonna do that, but that somebody had to try. And so we've been pushing, um, you know, I, I look at New York City's 30,000 acres of parks, 20,000 acres of natural areas, the 160 miles of beaches and waterfronts at the Parks Department. These are all infrastructure projects, they are not necessarily infrastructure projects as we think of them now, but they are there and they are uh, tools for New York City and New York City cannot maintain them. We don't allocate anywhere near the amount of funding to, to do daily maintenance on them, 
let alone the capital maintenance, which now measures in the you know, hundreds of billions of dollars to, to bring you know, things like drainage up to speed. So for me, uh, it's really a campaign about bringing awareness to this issue, to what these spaces can do for the city of New York, not just as fantastic green spaces to enjoy, but to really be tools in, in our fight against climate change. And, and flooding is one of the main issues that nearly every park is facing. Um, thanks for that. Thanks for your support for New York sure. <laughs> City Parks. Um, my name is Marit Larson, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Natural Resources and Planning, as, as Maggie mentioned. And I have, I think I have a few visuals if I can get them going. Um, oops, I went too far. Um, I um, just want to sort of highlight what you mentioned about the vital green infrastructure of the parks system of. <coughs> Uh, we're one of the largest landowners in New York City, and we spend a lot of our time uh, trying to, to demonstrate and communicate about and then implement what's needed in order to make sure that our green infrastructure has the same attention and uh, uh, is maintained and rebuilt, but, the, but really focusing on maintaining here as, um, as, as gray infrastructure and trying to get that message across that it's uh, just as important um, at times and in certain places <coughs> to focus on the living infrastructure as it is the subways and, and roads and um, our gray infrastructure. We work very closely with our um, New York City Department of Environmental Protection on all the, the gray infrastructure, but uh, it's really that pairing together that provides the co-benefits that we've all heard talked about that we really try to to emphasize, um, again, to those you know, decision makers. So you're not gonna have those co-benefits, you're not gonna have the cleaner air, the, the cooling, the flood absorption, and the aesthetic or, or educational, even just you know, um, value of, of beauty uh, and habitat if you don't maintain. So it's a, um, it's a constant um, challenge. So we have you know, the resources that range from the green infrastructure, stormwater green infrastructure you might have heard, um, you might be thinking of, and coastal infrastructure, but we also view our you know, over a million trees in our streets and landscapes, and our, um, our over a thousand acres of wetlands, and our you know, close to 10,000 acres of forests as part of that essential infrastructure. And um, all of those, you know, the, just the sheer number of those assets in different places make it uh, really challenging to address um, all of the, uh, to get the high performance that you'd want in, in each of those systems. And so I think, you know, over the course of other questions today, you know, you'll, we'll talk about some strategies, but I uh, just wanted to, to reemphasize what, what's been brought up as trying to get the message that uh, it's, uh, it, it is at our peril that we neglect following up once we've built the thing um, mm -hmm. to actually um, maintain it through partnerships and, um, and other strategies. Great, thank you. Well, we're kind of talking about what you tend to think about the end of the project development cycle, right, maintenance, but let's back up and talk about design and how design and how things are designed can actually ease or complicate the maintenance considerations of a project. So anyone who wants to speak to that, please jump in. Uh, yeah, architect. Don't design it like the High Line. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, would do it. I mean, yeah, there's, there's so many different examples of um, complicated designs for city parks that make it incredibly difficult and expensive to maintain. And I think that the, you know, in New York City, the Parks Department does a very good job of trying to standardize a lot of the elements that are put into our city's parks so that they can be more easily maintained. The balance there is that you don't want everything to look the same and for it to be mundane. And so it's a little bit of a balance. I think you know, with a lot of the marquee parks that are being built in New York City, uh, they're all coming with real resi resiliency focused uh, measures. And um, I think that communities have now seen the a lot of these marquee parks get built and how expensive they are main to maintain. So they are asking questions up front, very similar questions that we're talking about here. How is this going to be maintained? How can we be sure that this isn't going to be derelict in five to 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in most cases, the city doesn't have an answer. 
uh, they got funding either through the mayor or through a council member to get something built. The mayor will be gone, the council member will be gone when this is really a, in, a, in a tough state and then you know, you're starting from scratch again. Um, so figuring out you know, the, the, the parts where there's a private component to them, private fundraising, et cetera, um, there are very few of them. I want to be clear that the, the idea of having conservancies for every park just does not work. But for mm -hmm. those that do, um, mm -hmm. private philanthropy, philanthropy can, can go towards capital with a demand that money goes towards maintenance mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but it's a drop in a bucket. It really, you, there's no replacement for public funding, whether that's city, state, or federal. Mm -hmm. um, we're working on a project right now that's actually on the waterfront. Um, Maritime Park, it, is a, it was a, a dry dock that the city purchased, po like post-industrial site. Um, and we're working with, uh, Scape as the landscape architect, and one of the things they've recommended in our design is we do pop-up parks, mm -hmm. which is kind of setting short-term, two to three year time frame uh, for temporary uses. And the majority of that site, we are looking to make a nursery. Um, so it lowers the cost of overhead and mm -hmm. establishes plantings on a site with wind, salt, sun, whatever you name it, um, so that as we establish that site, we have less capital costs to build it because we have more mature plantings, and those plantings are more tolerant for the site we're doing. So that's something new that we're seeing in design. We haven't done in the past, but I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's, good. it's an opportunity for the community to be engaged on the site kind of see the site grow, and then those plant things get to um, actually behave in the environment where they were nurtured. That's, that's a good point. I know a county in South Jersey that decided to grow their own plants for all of their projects, so they have their own greenhouses. I think design, <laughs> you know, I tend to think of, you know, the architect, hmm. but when you look at the plants you select, when you look at your locations, you know, obviously simple can always be a little bit better in terms of the maintenance side of things, making sure that you're using plants that are become more well known, obviously that are native, um, because that maintenance aspect is also very important in terms of when you initially design it. And one thing I, I want to throw in here, because it reminded me when I saw your slide about dunes, hmm. right? So, um, in the Pinelands, of course, we extend inland and always to the coast, and I consider dunes to be a more natural, you know, green infrastructure, right, that protects our communities. And a project that we had been involved with is just the natural regeneration of dunes. Um, you know, a lot of money is spent on creating dune systems because we've wiped them out so significantly over the years and once a storm hits a community, it's like, oh no, we need to build this because look at that community over there that had a great dune system and they were protected. Now we hurry up and let's get this together. Well, it's also super expensive and then you also have to maintain that versus a slightly slower process but natural dune system where you just protect the back end of beaches or even if we're talking about like estuary areas um, instead of just like your um, ocean coasts. And you see a natural regeneration without planting anything as long as you're not raking, walking, or driving on sections where the natural seed bank comes back in just a year. And in just two to three years, you already start seeing an elevation of the land. So just trying to expand our scope a little bit here when we talk about the design, making it real simple where you don't even have to manufacture a dune because nature will do it for you as a, again another resilience option. I'll just add to the design. I think you, you just mentioned um, a whole, the whole spectrum you know, in some ways from what mm -hmm. we deal with in parks where we're retrofitting green infrastructure where we really try to focus on you know, the right plants, but also um, some a sort of a simple mantra that we think about, like um, the um, s fewer, denser, uh, and more resilient plants, and um, so that we don't end up having, when I term this sort of a, a fussy site, where mm -hmm. you know you're not gonna be able to um, have the 
the resources to go and maintain that gets needed, you know, then to all the way the extreme, as you mentioned, trying to really work with this, the sites that you have. Um, why, I'll just emphasize a couple of things that we've learned in the you know, design process over and over again is really pay attention to lessons learned because you have, you have new staff, you have new designers, you don't necessarily have the, the um, the sort of in-house knowledge to recognize that that didn't work, or you know, yes, these plants look great on paper, but actually, um, you know, they they function differently when you've got in this kind of dense envir environment. We really look at what kind of stressors you're dealing with. Where is it going to be heat? Is it going to be exposure? Is it going to be you know they're going to get inundated? Where is it? Um, what does it look like? What can you deal with at the site? And then also uh, looking ahead to um, when you walk away from this site. Are you likely to have a partner? Whether it's a you know conservancy <laughs> that's few and far between, but mm -hmm. is there maybe a friends group? Do you have uh, enough of a partnership to get it through at least the establishment period? And, um, so mm -hmm. a couple more yeah, designs. That's great, things. and that's a great segue into the next question, which is really about adaptive management and how do we ensure, like Mara, you're saying, that we learn from these projects um, as we're building them. And that not just that we learn that, that we share those lessons out, right? Between a big agency like the Parks Department, how do you make sure that that gets you know fed into all the divisions that have responsibility for both the design and construction and the maintenance of those facilities? Um, so if folks want to share anything about, you know, we're in a pretty new field here, right? So how are you learning? How are you able to kind of capture that knowledge and you know, codify it in a way so that it gets built into the next to the next generation of projects. I'm happy to start. Mm, I'm um, looking at you, Caleb, okay. so I don't know. <laughs> Go for it. Um, two things that we've adopted is one's part of our capital plan, one's part of our maintenance plan. Um, we finance a lot of our projects through state revolving loan fund. Uh, it's an EPA source of funds that offer uh, low cost, no cost, and sometimes cost upsetting financing for green infrastructure. And one of the things that's permissible in that program is capitalizing establishment costs, which is a complicated way of, of saying they allow you to bond for two years of maintenance in your original mm -hmm. finance stack, which is important. So we just built a project um, over 10 years. It was about an $80 million project. And for the first two years of that project, we are contracted with uh, the actual person who built the park to maintain the assets that are an engineered practice. And it was, it was long-term finance, so we have both a run-in for the, uh, I like to think of it like you, you wouldn't turn on a sewer plant without commissioning it. So these practices are actually like being commissioned so that they function and are performing. Um, and that's paid through through our original finance package. And I think that that's an interesting approach, and I would encourage others to explore that because um, it both gives the time for the practice to mature a little bit, um, and it keeps, uh, whether it's the installer or the contractor or the subcontractor, they're kind of on the hook for making sure that things are both uh, installed per the specifications and then managed per the specifications. And on the other side of that, we have kind of a book of business that we add layers to every year, and it's actually a maintenance schedule and a plan. So it's not ad hoc. We, don't, we aren't going out and going out to bid for multiple different contractors. There is either a contract that we have where those uh, people are familiar with the practices, or we have done training in-house and kind of separated out what is a more public works function versus what is a uh, needs a arborist or, a, a, or or someone on staff at that um, landscape firm to be able to come in and, and manage it. And we distinguish between those things, schedule it, and familiarize ourselves with the practices. And, and again, we're not as diverse as New York City, but I just think having a plan is is pretty important. And then you fit you kind of back into how you need to finance that plan. I think you know I'm trying to pull those pieces together, you say adaptive management and, and lessons learned as it relates to the maintenance of these projects. And what we have found is that, you know, there's not many resilience officers, mm -hmm. although at least the New Jersey side or South Jersey, right? How many of you know or have a town that has a resilience officer? 
I saw no. hand go up. <laughs> if all their hands went up, I knew they lived yeah. in your city. You know? No, I don't think so. Um, he invited your family. Yeah, yeah I know. Right? He invited Thank his whole guy. family, friends. You know. <laughs> yeah. In any case, um, in South Jersey, looking at the model, we have one office of sustainability at a county level. And it's a great model because they obviously have that culture and mindset to plan for a variety of things. And sustainability, obviously, is a big word and term that is used. But they're very much focused on green infrastructure, have their own greenhouses, use those plans to maintain their, you know, whatever their projects are. And so what we are learning from the nonprofit side, advocacy side, being able to share those lessons with other communities is that obviously having someone, having that culture, having that office is obviously key. Where you don't, and obviously it will take more time in certain communities to build up and, and have like a resilience officer, that there's going to be more support needed from volunteer, and so maybe if it is like a park conservancy or another nonprofit or a friends group, that that is a way to adjust and adapt over time so you're not losing these projects that have been built, right? So it's really a combination of efforts from like the top down and bottom up, and we're trying to, you know, learn from the projects we've put in and the communities where we see change where we have uh, stronger support by the government, where we have lesser, and where we can pull in the support needed to adapt over time and make sure, again, that these things aren't lost. Mm -hmm. I would add that um, for us, I think the biggest uh, upcoming challenge with adaptive manages, management will be in the uh, constructed stormwater green infrastructure uh, because we, we already have a culture of that uh, within the Parks Department in our natural resources group um, because although we always say we'll, we're you know, building and restoring sustainable s systems, we know in an urban environment that uh, that requires constant um, m management. So in whether it's uh, in our forest restoration contracts, which we've made very long. We wouldn't, I wouldn't call them a, that they have an establishment period per se, but they really go through that arc of prep preparing the site all the way to a, to an, uh, a point at which um, it's not quite adaptive management, but, but um, we then kind of I don't know, transition into a, a real partnership with our stewardship program where we can um, uh, prioritize sites where we can bring community groups in and volunteers, and have, we've built a network of you know, thousands of, of volunteers, and some of them with, um, that are called super stewards that can you know, have their, their sort of autonomy and be able to work in a site, and sort of building that culture of, uh, through, uh, that is essentially adaptive management. Um, it's, it's something we also try to do with uh, grants, so we'll also not necessarily in a contract bring in um, or modify a contract to include that, but uh, we try to staff up um, with, again, it's you know, soft money people, it's grant-funded people, but that, um, that's why we go for those people, because we also want to make sure that we have that, um, those sort of, if not labor crews, then, then we, you know, we might use all sorts of disciplines to participate in the adaptive management. We have PhD ecologists out there, you know, restringing um, fence and replanting. We really bring all of our resources to bear, uh, but it is an outstanding, I think, challenge that we're especially going to see with stormwater green infrastructure. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, we're talking about a couple of different types of infrastructure when you're talking about plants, et cetera. Those are tend to be the cheapest part of the infrastructure piece that's there. And what New York City has done over the last 50 years is waited until things have gotten so bad and hope for a federal bailout so that you can do the underlying drainage, do that sort of thing. That hasn't been fixed. You know, that hasn't, there's no, there's no stu super steward that's gonna come in there with a concrete truck and like figure out how to, how to deal with these underlying pieces of green infrastructure. So I think that's where the real challenge is. I think there's, it's not that these other pieces aren't challenging, but people can go out and do these things in an organized fashion if the organization is structured through an agency or a city or a muni municipality. Um, my bigger fear is the underlying infrastructure, the drainage piece, the, whatever those things may be that are so far beyond the city's budget to do anything with, so far beyond volunteer efforts 
Um, what is positive about where we are right now is there's just such greater recognition and the value of these pieces of infrastructure than there was in the past that it's impossible to ignore uh, for elected officials. So that's, that's like the, the positive direction that we're headed. I mean, just an observation on that point. So there's a lot of work being done right now on the perimeter of our communities. Hoboken's building a coastal levy system. New York City's building a coastal levy system. Those have to be complemented by a drainage system that performs during coastal storms. So I think that there's an opportunity for New York. I know that for Hoboken, it is much more difficult to modify existing parks than it is to design and implement new systems mm -hmm. through parks. Mm -hmm. We you call it a parks as defense strategy, but you have to, if a hurricane comes, you have to be able to deal with surge and rainfall. Um, we have a CSO system. New York has a CSO system. We're trying to reduce overflows to the Hudson River. You do that through managing water, you know, keeping water out of the system, creating more space within the system, and ultimately trying to do uh, separated sewer pumping. So I, I think that that's a great point. Drainage and irrigation are probably two of the most difficult issues uh, and shade, really, like to deal with in, in a managed practice. So I just, I, I agree. Well, there's so many different directions. I feel like we could go um, into this now, but we have about 10 more minutes, I think, before we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So why don't we just get down to the nitty gritty, which is funding um, for maintenance. Um, and so, you know, there's, you know, this is the challenge, and where should it come from? We've heard a few things discussed already, philanthropy as a source, the need for the, you know, public municipalities um, to, to chip in and to, to be pressured by the public to recognize how essential this is. Um, I'm curious about what you said about Pineland supporting maintenance um, after you've built projects and how you fund that work because, of course, that has a cost that comes associated with it. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't we just open it up and for like kind of creative uh, strategies you've heard of for financing, maintenance, um, would love to uh, bring that to the crowd. Well, I will say that, I mean, it's not creative asking foundations to give you money. Um, <laughs> I think, well, I don't know where you're all from, but for us, you know, that's a given. So, uh, you know, it may seem easy, but like we all know, maintenance, it's like, well, why would we fund maintenance, right? These people need to take ownership of it, but we're convincing them that it takes a while to build the culture over time, to have the staffing that understands it and then can do that work. So we need to help, you know, bridge that gap. So that's one. We are also part of New Jersey's like flood defense coalition, and so we're working on trying to get more municipalities, counties, or existing MUAs to create stormwater utilities. Mm -hmm. So there goes a mechanism by which, you know, hopefully, you know, those utilities that get created actually will continue to support green stormwater infrastructure projects rather than gray, but obviously could do both, um, especially where you're in a CSO community, right? Um, so that's an option. Um, we are trying to look at more creative, innovative concepts. One in which we are trying to work more, and I guess it's not so much direct funding, but really taking responsibility from the commercial side of things so that they're maintaining their sites and projects right there, which of course they have a responsibility for, but trying to maintain or change their landscape so that they're working landscapes. Right, so it's a slightly different terminology than just saying green stormwater infrastructure, but there are some really cool ideas. You know, Subaru in the city of Camden has converted their lawn area so that they have like um, food beds. And so having community members come in as volunteers to harvest and maintain that. They have employees that are working on it. So you can create like fun opportunities that can also continue to maintain and fund and support these things without necessarily having like the stick approach where it's like, oh no, well you need to maintain all this stuff here. Um, and it costs X amount of dollars, uh, but instead of having like your detention basins, they, if they look at their landscape as a living, working landscape that can have multiple elements associated with it, maybe then it becomes less costly and doesn't require a significant bottom line 
in what they're doing, and that means less runoff and material going off into the streets that then are the responsibility of your, your local government. So again, trying to launch that model through philanthropy, but that if it takes hold, that it becomes more of these smaller projects, smaller entities, less so on the government that then has to have a bottom line financing all of this. One of the things that we've been looking at is parks improvement districts, model of the sort of business improvement districts, and to the extent that these types of projects are falling into those mm -hmm. districts, whether there are those alternative dedicated funding sources that, that you, know, you know the amount you're going to get every year, every month, and you can budget out a number of years to be doing those types of repairs. Um, you know, dedica dedicated tax streams that go directly to the agency that don't get muddied up in the general fund of the city, but are really dedicated towards the, the maintenance of, of this type of infrastructure is another thing we've been looking at. You know, all of them take a ton of work to get anybody to buy into them, but it's, it's you know, you've seen this happen before in New York. Um, so most of this is really about making sure, it's not about getting a billion dollars tomorrow, it's about getting, you know, a, a dedicated amount that you can budget mm -hmm. and make plans for, for <coughs> capital maintenance or maintenance in the future. I think that one of the approaches, not one approach, it's the whole approach, um, is we maybe break it down to upstream, on-site, and downstream. So we try to, we obviously have money within our municipal budget and we try to grow that budget every year. You have to have a core uh, piece of money that's dedicated to the funding, but when I say upstream, I mean we try to distribute practices through all six wards, so our six specific council people all want their practice to be maintained the best. There's three uh, ward council members that are uh, at large, so they represent the entire community. Um, so we distribute practices so that there, there's benefits to all that are sitting on the city council that are making the budget. Um, we work with commercial partners where we can. If there's adjacency, we try to get um, some contribution, ownership, sponsorship, stewardship. Um, on site, we have um, either a park or, or the practice itself. We have the business improvement district that might come through and do trash management for it. Just keeping them clean is something that is that you know that that informs the community's perspective on whether this is uh, loved, maintained, performing properly, and picking up garbage is is part of that. And then downstream, we have a partnership with our sewage authority where, if it's an engineered practice and there's anything below surface that has to be maintained. We have shared services agreements with them um, because it's helping their combined sewer overflow goals. So what I would say our, our approach would be was, is try everything once. And, <laughs> and, 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 um, and don't think that uh, just funding something through the municipal budget is the only way to uh, fund the maintenance of a practice, but it's a very good start. Sometimes you have to create an argument that is so strong that it can't be dismissed, and so I'll, I'll just say what I started at the beginning, but we go back to the risk is real. You know, is 75% of the community in the floodplain? Did you flood during these flood events? Is it costly in the terms of business continuity, loss of services, circulation for our practices not to perform well, and is it disruptive in such a significant way that we should be putting money and resources where our values are? Um, and I'll give you an example of that. This past fall, we had major tropical storm. I think we had like four and a half inches of rain. We had only, we had flooding through one tide cycle, and this was in the New York Times article, but we hosted our arts and music festival like the next day. Major cultural event, and that if uh, these systems are disaggregated, but if the aggregate consequence of us not maintaining our practices well and not investing them is uh, loss of culture, vibrancy, uh, in my case, loss of uh, rateable base, or people moving out of town or people moving into town. They're, we tie the arguments for this back to things that are uh, values that are across the community, including public safety. So. Yeah, I think that's a, a critical um, for us um, coming at it from you know the, the parks per department perspective. There is no way that we can you know sort of advocate for ourselves to get the funding needed to to maintain um, you know the the all the components that would really contribute to the, the flood reduction and resiliency benefits. So it's really critical to look at it at, 
at a city level, mm -hmm. and ultimately, you know, we're not the agency that's necessarily looking at uh, the the financing mechanisms for coastal or or um, landslide stormwater resiliency, but we're part of that. Uh, network, literally the landscape, uh, and where that work needs to happen. So I think looking at how um, all the contributions that are made um, in the infrastructure throughout, you know, not just you know, in agency borders, but across the, how the system works is, is going to be critical and hopefully will, um, that will result then in, in on the ground um, improved you know, funding and adaptive management. Yeah. Could I add real quickly? Sure. My apologies. <laughs> um, but I, I, something that I think actually tends to be overlooked is where you have existing money and how it's defined that it could be used. So, for instance, state of New Jersey, you know, passed voter referendum, corporate business tax, dedication of money, supposedly, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for open space protection, Blue Acres, historic preservation, so like buying flood prone properties, but there was a component called stewardship. And so where you can change definitions or have an interpretation of what that definition means could mean an expansion of where you can use funding for projects like this. And I see in a similar situation in a municipal utility authority in Evesham Township where no stormwater utility, but they had green infrastructure projects. And because, I mean, they have a pretty nice size budget, it just took the executive director changing the line item because he felt it fit within their mission to allocate money for maintenance of these projects. Didn't require a new fee, didn't require a new utility, didn't require going out to the motor. So sometimes those simplistic changes can mean more money for projects. And obviously a shift, but also because it has a greater benefit, can actually be cost savings later on. Thank I'll shut you. up now. No, no don't no. shut up. Um, well, I just want to add to that one thing we're not going to get a chance to talk about, but we talked about in our um, kind of prep session, was about trying to link these efforts with things like workforce development. So to the extent that we can say, well, there's maybe not a pot of money for maintenance, but maybe there's money for workforce development. How can we uh, leverage those funds and actually you know, bring to bear the power of training people in the new jobs that we know are needed to confront the challenges of climate change um, and use those monies to actually help with on the ground maintenance as well. So there were many questions we didn't get to, but I, I wanna make sure to get to your questions. So um, why don't we open it up now for folks who have questions for the panel. So how do you see balancing this real need for maintenance? I mean, there's two parks, I think, that have wedge certification that are within New York City parks and not a partner. Hunters Point Park South opened in 2018 and we're facing a serious remediation project already because one of the berms has a planting failure. The one in the Bronx is, I think, under the remit of the uh, Bronx River Alliance. So, you know, you have groups that'll help, but you know, Queens is lacking in parkland. As you're advocating for new spaces, how do you balance the desire to see these spaces be built for the future with the reality that, unfortunately, under this administration, parks is not getting the funding it needs to support them, and a lot of those parks are in environmental justice communities where people are really at capacity. They, they don't have the ability to bring out a group and do the maintenance that's required when parks can't. So. You know, we, but we know we need inland flooding remediation and bioswales and park spaces. So what do you see as the balance of providing the needed park spaces with the knowledge that climate change is happening and if we're not building for it, getting funding from New York City to redo a relatively new park is also an uphill battle. Tough question. Yeah, that's a <laughs> tough one. Um, I'll, I guess I'll give it. Uh, try and I'm not sure I heard every element of the the question. Um, I think generally, we, we try to balance you know and, and taking an opportunity to uh, with capital funding and a lot of the grant funding that we pursue is is capital. So taking an opportunity and um, pursuing it, even though we might not have all the answers. Um, 
to how it's going to be maintained in the long run. Um, that is sort of the, the history of how a lot of projects get built. Um, I think we've we've also you know, tried to be a clever when we can, identifying if there's a way to extend sort of a, a scope to include maybe, um, like I mentioned before, more staff than maybe might be needed, um, you know, on, on, on paper to, to actually implement a project and that kind of extends uh, the life. Um, we also try to, again, go to the design component and how do we make sure that um, looking at other sites, other projects, where, what are the easiest kinds of sites to maintain? Unfortunately, sometimes that would, might lead you know, in one perspective you to say, well, like, let's just have more pavement then because that's going to be easier and fewer, fewer plants and that's a real risk as well. But how can we uh, get what we actually need at a site and that's where it's getting community input, really understanding what's needed at a location and um, what l lessons we can bring from how to sort of have fail safe designs uh, that can at least utilize this resulting as a minimum, uh, you know, the minimal maintenance needs. So it's a, a hodgepodge of, I think, approaches, um, at least. I, I would like to jump in mm -hmm. here um, just to talk a little bit about the RAIN Coalition, which is the group that I support. And there is a slide in there, Mara, I don't know if you can find it for RAIN. Oh, right. But it is a model of bringing together watershed organizations, and I used to be at the Bronx River Alliance. Um, so it's a partnership of four watershed organizations. It's Bronx River, <laughs> Newtown Creek, Flushing Creek, Gowanus Canal at the moment, and we're working with two workforce development groups, the HOPE Program and Green City Force. And the idea is to really link the two things, the need for climate justice and for training folks in frontline communities to be able to get these jobs of the future, and also to be able to bring up the level of service for maintenance for these projects. So right now it is funded through uh, philanthropy. I guess the slide's not there. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, it's funded through philanthropy right now, but we are at the point where we're trying to make a case to the city that there's a new way we can think about this. We can really think about bringing together these two different sectors that aren't always aligned. Um, and, um, you know, and hopefully move towards a model where um, the city might adopt a different approach. And in fact, um, the Department of Environmental Protection did put out an RFP for a stormwater maintenance pilot in East New York and Ozone Park that is linked with workforce development. So we're seeing, you know, the city also innovating. We're having conversations. Um, and I think, you know, that's probably where we are with a lot of this right now is we're all trying things and seeing what can work. I would just add that it, you know, we, when we have these kinds of conversations where you're talking about what could happen, what should happen, we're sort of avoiding the politics of this, which is something that you're speaking about. These projects are political and politicians respond to people being angry. And that's sort of the business I'm in. In addition to making maintenance sexy, I'm in the business of angry. Um, and, uh, so I think you know, the neighborhoods you're talking about in Queens are des desperate and getting elected leaders to understand that. I do think there's a changing narrative coming out of COVID particularly, how many people were in their parks and how many people realized how poorly maintained many of those spaces are um, has really changed the narrative and, uh, and the need. And so I think that there's, there are avenues through advocacy to draw more attention to the exact communities and neighborhoods you're talking about, which is what, you know, that's where we work. Why don't we see if we can get a couple more questions in. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have any guidance for s starting the conversations with the union employees who will need to learn new practices and um, guidelines for nature-based infrastructure? You said union? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I could speak specifically to union. Obviously, I guess that gets into some of the politics of like who you know, who are the higher ups to contact to get that introduction to, to find the local champions that are willing to bring that up and make that part of their regular training because it, that's really key. Um, we're also finding that it's important to start early 
right? We're, we're trying to train people and find champions that maybe aren't necessarily, let's say, in the unions or in that field, but are going to be the, the new entrepreneurs or you know, eventually get that training and become those employees so that they bring that groundswell of change as well. So it's really a combination of efforts that I've found that we have to continue to work on because you know, if you can't get access to or any interest, obviously that's going to be super difficult. So the, the question is about union employees? Yeah, so we have supervisors union, employees union, um, and then our director is not civil service, not union. And so we actually don't go through our director for education or leadership on this, and we go directly to the supervisor's union to discuss the value of the practices. Mm -hmm. A lot of our staff pride themselves on being like Hoboken born and raised, and we talk about the contribution of the practices, how they work in flood risk, and then we also don't try to introduce new tools or procedures quickly. Um, literally, like what tools do you have at your disposal? What are you comfortable working on? And then getting into a repetitive program. And then if there are staff members that express interest, providing them with continuing education or incentives to perform over time. One more question. Oh, yeah, thanks for uh, all the insights you shared. I was struck right from the start at your attention to sort of safety of communities, value added, quality of life, and then uh, your question about, you know, how do we convince public officials, funders, uh, to, to really prioritize maintenance in the long term. So my question is really thinking about to, to what extent have you all partnered with social scientists to document kind of the comprehensive ways in which communities, residents, even, even the decision makers benefit from these processes of maintenance or even design um, to kind of use as evidence, you know, for convincing them. And it, it seems like there's a real opportunity there to think about strategically prioritizing social science research right at the start, which can help future funding opportunities and create that, you know, really nice cycle where you're documenting the research, but also um, using that on a long-term basis to get that funding. So my question after all of that is, what are your thoughts on incorporating social science to kind of spearhead some of these uh, real needs um, for funding for, um, community benefits. Do you guys mind if I jump in? <laughs> well, um, there is some <laughs> partnerships already, like there's the Urban Field um, Station here in New York City that Parks is leading along with their um, US Forest Service, and they do a lot of great social science research. Um, Rain Coalition right now is engaged in writing one of those big grants, and we are um, wanting to push in the application the need for more community engagement and volunteerism. So what is very helpful is to go to a paper that has been written that does show that you know, where there is more community engagement and community connection and volunteerism, you see better results. So I just kind of lay that out as a first reaction to like, I, you know, it, I think it's incredibly important to be able to back up our claims around these things, especially when applying for um, government funding, other kinds of philanthropic funding. All right, it's important for the culture change. I mean, understanding what terms to use, what resonates with people. I, mean, I went through this when we had a very large coalition at the state level in New Jersey about how you get people to vote in support of dedicated funding for open space. It was like, don't use these terms, use water supply. And you know, I told you what to say and what not to say. And I think that has to be the case as well for, for what we're doing. And of course, you know, there isn't a ton of money out there at times to be able to have that element brought into it. But it is something that uh, we're trying to do now as we're getting ready to embark on a new venture called our, our Pinelands Research Institute. And so we very much want to bring in the social science and partner with the universities. We have a strong partnership with, with Rutgers and Stockton. And um, so that will present an opportunity where hopefully we can do more of that. Um, but it's very important. 
Yeah, and as Meg mentioned, we've worked really closely with the, the Forest uh, for Service social scientists, um, and we've, at, at Parks, uh, looked at, uh, have had a long partnership looking at the value and the outcome of investing in parks and has, um, there was a, a six year study that looked at um, how the investment in um, parks that had been under invested in uh, changed the behavior and use uh, and the extent of which it had an impact through the neighborhood. So that was a really uh, useful and, and telling study and that was just funded for another six years. So. Um, or three years, but in any case, um, there's absolutely, um, there can be a lot more of that specifically related to um, green infrastructure would be great to see. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at time now. Why don't we give a round of applause to our <laughs> panelists. Um, we will be out and about, so feel free to, you know, come up and uh, ask questions. Let's continue the conversation over lunch and then in the other sessions. <laughs> I wish you'd said.